So let me start by introducing the first panel that we're going to have today. Um, it's going to be introduced by Arun Majumdar, the co-director of the Precourt Institute, and I think you all know him from the first day. And we really have the great pleasure of having three of our uh, deans from, from the schools around Stanford here to uh, talk with Arun. And uh, the three deans that we have today, uh, first we have um, Pam Matson. Uh, she is a global thought leader. She's, well, first of all, she is the uh, Dean of the School of Earth, Energy and Environmental Sciences. She's a global thought leader who works to reconcile the needs of people and the planet in the 21st century. Her research addresses a range of environment and sustainability issues, including sustainability of agriculture systems, vulnerability of particular people and places to climate change, and environmental consequences of tropical land use change and global change in the nitrogen and carbon cycles. Um, next, we have uh, John Levin. He is the Dean of the Graduate School of Business, and he's been a professor at Stanford for more than 15 years, and previously served as chair of Stanford's Department of Economics. He's an econo economist with interests in industrial organization, market designs, design, and the economics of technology. And last but not least, in front of me here is uh, Jennifer Widom. She is the Dean of the School of Engineering. She's a professor of computer science and electrical engineering at Stanford. Previously, she'd served as the computer science department chair from 2009 to 2014, and School of Engineering senior associate dean from 2014 to 2016. Her research interests span many aspects of non-traditional data management. And so, with this uh, distinguished panel that we have here, I'll turn it over to Arun to uh, well, thank, thank you, Richard. Discussion. And good morning to all of you. How has been the first two days? It's been good? Yeah. Terrific. Well, let me just say that uh, it's a terrific honor to have uh, three deans out here. As I mentioned on day one, we've had more than 700 graduate students go through this program. But this is very special for you because it's the first time we have three deans together. <laughs> so this is, uh, in many ways, we'll see how the dialogue goes, and uh, I think you'll get a lot of insights about Stanford in general. So let me start with Dean uh, uh, Pam Matson of uh, the School of Earth, Energy, and Environment. Before we go there, how many from the School of Earth, Energy, and Environment? There you go. We have a fair number out here. So Pam, you have been, um, you have been de Dean for several years, and in fact, a long time. A long time. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, much of the energy uh, research activity, educational activity uh, on energy and environment sustainability, and it can be traced back to you. You have been the catalyst for these institutes, the Precourt Institute, the Woods Institute. Perhaps you could just give us a little insight on how it all started, how it, you know, how it came around, sure. and what was the thinking at Stanford as a campus, and then we'll sort of go and look ahead in the future. Okay. Great. I, I would love to talk about that. First of all, I should say I was just one of many people who created, who made these interdisciplinary institutes at Stanford and the interdisciplinary collaborations come together. So I can't take all the credit, but I was there at the time it happened. Let me just for a moment go back to the fact that you know, Stanford's been in the resource research area from its very beginning. It was one of the things that founded Stanford was the need to find resources to allow the development of the Western US and broader to, to uh, meet the needs of people here and elsewhere. So we have a long history at Stanford University. You don't think about that so much today, but that's how we started. And indeed, we've been working on energy resource issues um, and technologies for a very, very long time, for, for you know, a, more than a century. Um, now, you started out in the oil and gas world, and we're still there in some ways, um, but we've evolved in, in a great number of different directions um, into energy technologies of all sorts, and I think importantly into thinking about energy as a system and as a part of a much broader system that goes well beyond energy to meeting the needs of people, protecting other things we care about in the process of doing that. So, very much a systems perspective today. So back in, I think, 2002, I think we made our first major step as a university into um, the recognition that we could do more if we were all working together, if we were drawing in the expertise of Stanford's seven schools, 
as we work on energy. And so GSEP, the Global Climate and Energy Project, was the first thing, led by uh, Lynn Orr, uh, my dean predecessor, actually, um, and eventually Sally Benson, and, and you know, just the, the built this community of researchers. Soon after, and I think in some ways that set the groundwork for what came after as, as we created the Precord Institute and the Woods Institute for the Environment, Precord Institute for Energy, partner institutes. Always with the idea that our, one of our challenges is to meet the needs of people, of a still growing human population, of a, an increasingly consuming human population, but finding ways to do it in, in ways that don't forgo opportunities for the future, that don't uh, make our water resources, our food resources, our climate system, and other things not work well for us and for our children and grandchildren. So that, that's a sustainability objective. And we, I think, together worked on energy from that perspective. Um, the institutes uh, were purposefully intended to bring together faculty and students from all over the university. So in many ways, the deans have talked about this and been a part of this all seven deans for, you know, for 15 years or so. And that's a, an amazing thing about Stanford. Um, I don't know how much you all will interact with people from across the schools, but you've already built a community that does that. And so you might be running into people who are getting an MBA or a JD or a, any kind of engineering degree or degrees in, in the sciences. Um, and it's, it's, it's one of the great things about Stanford. It's one of the things we're known for and I believe it is absolutely essential if we're going to solve the energy challenges of the future. So as you look ahead now, and you know, Stanford was ahead of its time compared to other institutions in looking at energy environment in a very strategic way. As you look ahead and see how the world is evolving outside us, mm -hmm. um, are we positioned in the right way? And for the students in particular, uh, they're coming in in different schools. They're going to get their master's and PhD and you know, all in there. And they're going to dig deep into their own field. Perhaps you could give an uh, idea of how they should look at the experience at Stanford moving ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we all, especially you all graduate students, are going to delve deeply into your own area of research and development. You're, some of you are going to be focused very narrowly and deeply on uh, new technologies or, or new computational approaches or you know, new assessment approaches or whatever. There's a whole range of things. Again, all of our, our, our schools are engaged in. And that's great. Obviously, you need to be expert in those areas. But I think that the um, ability to see your own issues as part of a broader system is essential. You, I think in this day and age of rapid change and chaotic change out there in the world, um, we all need to be systems thinkers and analysts. We need to be able to see what, what we're most interested in in the context of the, of the feedbacks and trade-offs and unintended consequences, potentially, uh, between what we're doing and the rest of this system in which we're, again, trying to meet the needs of the people and protect the planet at the same time. So systems thinking, how do we do that? Um, and I think that uh, just by starting with conversations like this, you take a step in that direction. I think we need to, we need to find ways formally through our institutes of, of making sure that we're all having that opportunity. Terrific. Let me, let, let's move on to uh, Dean Levin. Uh, John, you are the Dean of uh, Graduate School of Business. Uh, before we go ahead, how many GSB students out here? Wow. They're generally the loudest crowd, by the way. <laughs> uh, I don't know if this year is louder than before or not, uh, but that's the bar for you guys. Um, so looking at Graduate School of Business, you've been in Economics Department, you've been a Department Chair, now in the Graduate School of Business. Um, I, I spoke earlier on Monday about how this is the largest industry, and $10 trillion per year, roughly. And that is going through a big transformation right now. From a business school perspective, what would you, how would you advise the students when they're coming in to look at this, not only the experience in GSB, but at Stanford as a whole? So first of all, it's just fabulous to see so many GSBers here. I'm delighted that we got, we're, we're turned out so well. Um, so I, I'd say a couple things about that. Yeah. So you know, first, for people coming into the, into the GSB, 
you know, the, you're going to get the experience just at the GSB. And, and those of you who are not in GSB have the opportunity to take classes at the GSB as well. That's, you know, that's, that's actually, like Pam just said, is focused sort of broadly on thinking about management as a, in a holistic way, about all the different aspects of what it takes to be a great manager, a great lead, business leader. And many of, the, so many of those skills are going to be broadly applicable across any industry that you go into. In fact, whether you go into the private sector or not, whether you go into the public sector or into the nonprofit sector, they're going to be just general management skills. We've had, over the, particularly over the last 10 or 15 years, just an enormous increase in the amount of interest among students in energy and sustainability. And that's been steadily on the rise for, for quite a while. And I think there's been, I think part of it is just the incredible opportunities in the energy sector and, and in, the, in sustainability. And part of it is just the growing social awareness of what an important issue it is for the country and the, and the world. And that's brought students into that. And part of it is institutional. Part of it is that we have a joint degree program with the IPER and that there's, at Stanford, there's many opportunities, as Pam just mentioned, to go around the campus. And I think for, People interested in energy, that's just a particularly salient thing because one of the things about Stanford that is, it, it is really extraordinary and it's hard to appreciate if this is the only place you've been as a, as a student. And some of you have been other places before, probably most of you. The barriers here between the schools are incredibly low. I mean, first of all, it's just the physical barriers. It's only a 15 minute walk between the GSB and, and, and here. So it's just easy to get around and it's, and it, and it's, um, and it's also, relative to many schools, it's culturally easier to get around. People are very open and welcoming to students from other schools if you go around and take a class in another department, another school. And so I think you have an amazing opportunity when you're here, and this is true for everyone, to ex look around and look through that whole course catalog and say, wow, that's, that looks like an incredible class over there in the engineering school. You know, I, I would, I would, Jennifer's teaching a great class this quarter, actually, on, and she told me the other day that the biggest contingent of people in her class, the big data class, are, are people from the GSB, actually. <laughs> so, the, 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 uh, at least who are registered so far. And, uh, and that's, a, that's, an, that's an incredible uh, opportunity that you have. And I, so I would really encourage everyone to, 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 to do that. The other thing I would say about Stanford, and this again goes to something that Pam just said, is, One thing that, as an institution, we've been really good at doing is, is, t is being able to go all the way from the most basic of technologies all the way through to the most applied of applications and have a relatively seamless flow from one end of that spectrum to the other. And so you know, people who are interested in energy, you, know, we have, we, you, know, you, you can go all the way from particle physics and crashing things into each other at Slack to to you know, to sort of more basic science in the in the in the Earth School, to more applied science around batteries or potential technologies, that, to the commercialization of those technologies in business, to the economics around those technologies or around systems change, to the law and regulation of those you know same technologies, and 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 actually we're world class at every step of the way. And so that is, I, just, you know, I think to go to, the, to, to Pam's point, you, you have the potential here to get that whole perspective, everything from what's driving the technologies in this industry, what's driving some of the underlying change, to how should we as a society think about the implications? How are things going to change in a way that we need to, you know, our, our industries are going to change, there's going to be business opportunities, there's going to be the need for regulation and, and, and social decisions. Uh, and I think that's something you hope, you know, getting that broad perspective is something that would be an amazing opportunity for each of you. Terrific. Well, let's move on to uh, Dean Widom, uh, School of Engineering. How many engineering students out here? <laughs> the largest number. <laughs> so you have a big contingent out yes. here. So Jennifer, perhaps you could, I mean, you're the most recent uh, dean of the uh, three of you. Um, and, but you have been senior associate dean. You have been the de department chair in computer science. Uh, you uh, led the SOE Future, which co -led was the, the SOE co -led Future. Co-led the SOE you. Future. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. We were very closely on, um, and no one wanted to call it a strategic plan. No. Nope. Just, just, you know. But it's about the future. Perhaps you could give us, give uh, the students an insight of where you think the School of Engineering is going. 
how does energy fit in, and how does the School of Engineering connect with other schools on campus to give the student a very holistic experience? Sure. Um, so I am the newest dean. Uh, it's been six months, just about my six-month anniversary. And when I was associate dean, actually one of the things I enjoyed most was working with Arun on our uh, thinking about the future of the School of Engineering. And the School of Engineering, uh, the work that goes on is from very basic, just completely intellectually driven science, essentially, up to very application-oriented work. And we are aiming in to solve world problems. That is really what it's about, and that's what people are interested in doing. And as part of our thinking about the future process, we outline 10 big challenges. Many of them are kind of what you would expect, and certainly energy was one of those challenges that the school is focusing on. While other people were talking, I was listening, but I was also doing a mental inventory of the nine departments in the school. And I bet if I ask, shall I try please, it? Please Let do. me just see if we've got people from every department, because in my mind, every department has work going on in energy. Computer science. What? <laughs> <laughs> but you're from computer where? science. Where? Well, I'm from. Where are the computer scientists? Data driven. Oh, thank you. Da data driven research and energy. Uh, how could one not be thinking about that? Do we have any statisticians here? Okay. Well, that's computer science with a oh, different yeah. name, I think. Right. <laughs> That's everything with a different name. <laughs> right, yes. OK, great. Uh, certainly, data-driven work in energy is super important. And we've got, we've got that going on in computer science and statistics. How about electrical engineering? We should have many of those out here. Um, mechanical engineering. Uh, management science and engineering, I hope. Excellent. Because I think one of our strengths is to think about energy policy. That's, Stanford has a great engineering school and a great university with a great business school. Policy is something I think we can be very strong in and not, maybe historically haven't thought about our strengths in that area. Management science and engineering is a department that thinks about that type of thing. How about civil engineering? Excellent. Bioengineering? How many people well, think bioengineering relates to energy? Right, so we'll have to <laughs> convince those bioengineers. <laughs> Material science, yes, I am not surprised. Great work going on in our material science department in, say, battery, nanomaterials for, for batteries, for storage. Um, how about chemical engineering? Surprising, surprising. That's, surprising. that's a little surprising. <laughs> Some of our departments are smaller than others, of course. And last, of, last but not least, Aero Astro. Ah, okay. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna, probe a couple of those departments, because every department in the engineering school has a footprint in the energy area. And the, what, so I want to emphasize that both within engineering and across the university, we have a lot of collaborative work going on. People want to see their work addressing world problems. And I would say energy is the problem that cross cuts every single one of our departments. And it's really on a lot of people's minds. As I mentioned, nanomaterials for, for batteries, data analysis at sort of the other end of the spectrum. We have a faculty member joint in uh, civil and mechanical engineering working on wind power. And he's taking, he's studying how. Uh, animals, how birds flock, how fish school, and how that can affect how you construct wind, uh, wind farms. Fascinating stuff. So really, we have things across the whole spectrum. Um, so I would encourage you to meet each other. That's what this is about. And again, the barriers here are very low. As John said, it's hard to appreciate that until you've spent time at other universities. But this is something that students tell us frequently, that that's one of the best experiences they have here. You can, students can be PhD students in one department and work with a faculty member in another department or another school. Students are frequently co-advised. In fact, we're very busy, the faculty, and some of the best way for us to get together is to have students that we co-advise working on problems that we're most interested in. We often say that PhD students are the glue that hold together the different faculty with their shared interests. Um, you asked about the future of the school. Uh, you know, in our, in our future planning process, one of the things that we were interested in doing was making sure we could enable big 
big, you know, solving the big problems with very interdisciplinary teams. So we've started a new initiative we call the Catalyst for Collaborative Solutions that is bringing together faculty from across the entire university, uh, giving them funding, pretty significant funding, to work with postdocs and graduate students from all the different areas on addressing world problems. Um, one other thing I just wanted to mention as an aside, how many of you were undergraduates here? Not many. We have great undergraduates here, and our undergraduates are also very eager to work on world problems. This is something that's on their mind, again, across all the different areas. So if you're in a research group, I encourage you to encourage your, your faculty advisor to involve undergraduates. Most do. And it also will give you a great experience in mentoring younger students. So one of the great experiences people can have here, particularly PhD students, is to become mentors for students who are really passionate about doing work in, um, in problems that will, in addressing problems that make a difference. And we do have many programs here for undergraduate research funding. So something to think about. Work with your co-graduate -stu students in your department, but also across departments work with undergraduates, work with faculty and postdocs. You'll get a really broad experience here, and what will tie everybody together is their interest in, in, in this case, energy. Terrific. Have you wanted to follow up? Yeah, I just, I want to second what you said about, you know, really, <laughs> every department in the university, practically, certainly every department in our school focuses on energy across department. We did an analysis, well, a planning process a few years ago, uh, identifying four societally important things that all of our departments in our school are focused on, that have their faculty and students are focused on. One, obviously, was energy. Every one of the departments had somebody working in these areas. Uh, climate, um, food and water, the nexus of food and water especially, and hazards, risk, vulnerability, resilience, those kinds of questions. And the interesting thing, of course, is so we can lay those four out as cross-cutting things. It could go way, it goes way beyond our school and to other schools as well. But, um, but they also all interact with each other. And so one of the things that we have done through the Precord Institute in the past is, is sort of a, a thought, thinking about connecting the dots. What are the, the connections between our efforts to meet and do research that will help address the energy challenge? And how do they connect with our efforts to meet food needs or to address climate issues and, and so forth. So again, that, just goes, that goes back to the systems perspective. But the fact is, this it cuts, cuts across so many parts of the university, and which is why, again, an institute is so important. The Precord Institute is so important because it acknowledges that you know, no one place in this university owns this issue. We all have to work together to address it. I was just going to jump in. I thought this will be a familiar example to many of you, but just to take one example to think about why, you know, when Pam talks about why the systems and the why different departments are, if you just think about, to take one example, think about something like fracking or the change in technology to drill wells, which is a technological innovation about how to do horizontal drilling and to you know, use a different technique to get more extraction from, from the existing oil fields. That's a, so that's technology. And you know that's the Department of Petroleum Engineering, which has been a stamp. I think it still exists, or did we it's, get rid of no, it? No, it's Energy Resources we got rid Engineering. Of it. <laughs> it used to exist yes. for a long time. Yeah, it did. It did. I mean, it's, we still do some of that work. Now we're looking at assessment of uh, how to do it better yeah, and do it better. out environmental. So you think we take you should take a technology like that, and of course, there's a technological aspect to it. There's a business aspect. We have we have alums who are in Texas. They're you know they're buying and selling the equipment, the oil fields, the you know the, that's they're in they're in project finance. They're financing equipment. And that's a, you know that's a that's a huge huge business for people interested in finance. Then there's enormous economic consequences because you look at the price of oil and it's completely changed. You look at the shift toward natural gas that's come out of that. That's you know, it's a complete transformation of the energy domestic energy use. There's an environmental set of environmental consequences. So there's a, lots of interesting questions about environmental regulation. And then there's geopolitical questions. It's completely changed the geopolitics around energy because we've gone from being a, an importer of, uh, of fossil fuels to an exporter of fossil fuels. It's totally changed the dynamic with oil-rich countries. So, you know, that's 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 just one example. And pretty much, there's many. The amazing thing about energy is there's many examples just like that. 
wind energy. But in other words, there's lots of examples that just span so many places. If you really want to understand it, you want to get those different perspectives. And you know, that's, that's something we, you can do here. That natural gas example is a great one because a few years ago, uh, the Precord Institute and Stanford Earth together created a, an initiative on that. It's called the uh, Natural Gas Initiative and NGI. And it's exactly that story. It's like how if natural gas is a transition fuel for us, how are we going to produce it in, in ways that, that reduce methane emissions and other things? How are we going to uh, produce it more efficiently? And then all of the geo geopolitical, economic, uh, international issues around it um, all together. And Arun knows more about this than well, I do by we're far. But we're talking about geopolitics. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have former Secretary of State George Schultz in the afternoon. So that'll be, I mean, he's got so many stories. And I'll, I'll open it up for questions, and you should ask him. And uh, I can assure you, this will be entertaining. <laughs> yeah, it will be very. So going back to the systems thinking and a holistic approach to this, I think, I mean, that's so important because the energy world, after, let's say, about 100 years of going along a certain direction, is that ship is now turning. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a major transformation coming. There's innovations which are needed that connects the dots, as you said, between technology, business, policy, finance, and other aspects, and just people acceptance. Um, and the, you mentioned about the Natural Gas Initiative, which is looking at, which brings, in fact, the campus together mm -hmm. um, and looking at it holistically. The next initiative that we started, Bits and Watts, and you guys had a tweet from Scylla talking about Bits and Watts. Um, so we're trying to do this, but are we, let, let's be critical of ourselves for a time, in, in a positive way. Are we doing enough? Or should we be doing more so that the students get the best experience looking, in a, so that they're best prepared for the future? We'll have to ask the students that, I guess. <laughs> I, I, you know, I think there is always more we can do, personally. Um, I do think that, um, there's, those programs provide really wonderful opportunities for students to do what they need to do as graduate students. You, I mean, you have a job here as graduate, not a job. You have, a, a, in a sense, a need to become expert in something, to be creative and innovative in your own area, to drive in your, own, your own ideas and drive them forward. So, you know, you all have to be focusing on that, too. But if you can think about through these larger programs, uh, larger communities of people engage in the breadth of thinking around them as you do your thing, um, you will end up much more flexible, I think much more open-minded, um, and open mindsets are critical in this, in this world. Um, and you will appreciate your own work, but you'll see how it fits more broadly. Um, sometimes I, I talk to corporate leaders who are, are, many of our students end up working in corporations and, and they, the corporate leaders say, well, you know, your students are fantastic. They are, you know, they are the strongest, you know, PhDs or master students we have. They're really creative and innovative and everything, but they, they, they need to think a little bit more about where what they're doing actually fits in the larger picture. And so one of our jobs is to figure out how to do that, to, to, to give you an opportunity to understand more broadly as you focus relatively narrowly. I would say let us, let's ask the students. So <laughs> one interesting thing about Stanford that's not, that's not always so They're obvious new, to students, part, well, <laughs> okay. is that uh, we're extremely bottom-up organization, very faculty-driven. Faculty sort of decide what's important, even what, they'll, what they teach. Of course, we have to try to cover most areas, but faculty have interests and often are teaching in those interest. We don't have people at the top telling everyone what to do. And that can actually lead to gaps sometimes. So I'd be curious actually to hear from the students. You're all first year students, correct? Mm -hmm. They and haven't so, started yet. And <laughs> yes, right. You haven't started, but you're probably looking at classes and signing up for classes. And you're probably doing many in your department, but also across. Is there anything missing? Has anybody looked and said, wow, there's, I, there's an area I'd love to be taking a class in and I can't find one? Yeah, I, yeah. So, I mean, we have an engineering professor, an economics professor, and like an energy systems professor. And I see this, this mesh go on back and forth between environment and finance and energy as a whole. But 
as Irina mentioned, it's a $10 trillion industry, and I feel like even the smallest percentage of that could be used to drive social change as well in some way. Do you guys ever incorporate like social problems into the technology? Yeah. Terrific. So, so we, uh, we mentioned that we ha that G GSB and Stanford Earth have a program that we host basically for the whole university. It's called EIPER. Are there any EIPER MBAs or okay? There's a few here. Okay, so I mean, it's it's a, it's an ex exactly that. It asks people to combine a sense of you know the technology or the economics or whatever with with social and political policy issues and bring them together. And are there classes offered, or what would a first year student do to get involved? Yeah, they would, they would be taking uh, courses, core courses that, that bring in the economics and business and the um, social, as well as biophysical parts of that mm -hmm. social environmental system that we're living in here. Um, but it's, it's a small program. We need, we need a lot more opportunities for everybody to engage in mm -hmm. that kind of conversation. And maybe maybe next year in the energy forum, this this uh, or in this activity, we can can bring some of that to the table because we do worry about it and think about it. I will say Stanford is not as strong in the, those areas as we should be, but but it's there. And I don't know whether John, whether you have any other. Yeah, I, I think so. I think part of it co that comes through the curriculum and comes through a pro programs like EIPER, and then part of that comes through you know, different types of other, you know, other, so for example, at the business school, we have an energy club that's really active, and we have a lot of students who are just thinking broadly about social, about social change, about how to, how to change the world in different, in different ways, and, there, and, and have many outlets. For, so we have a center for social innovation, for example, which has lots of classes that are geared toward things like how do you do social entrepreneurship, how do you develop a social venture, not specifically targeted at energy or at the environment, it could be many different things that you want to make change in, but thinking about how do you give students the tools to be effective at advocating for change in the world or, or being a force for change in the world. So that's I think that's I think there's many I think there's there are many opportunities to 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 do what you're talking about to think about the social consequences and and, and I think what you, you know, what you hope is that in in a class that say on environmental economics or energy economics, some of the issues about sort of what are the social priorities and how should we think about things broadly from societal, those should come to the fore at some point in the class. And you sort of hope that that's going to come, come into the, the, the discussion. And I think it mostly does, but, it, you know, it, but it, it may depend a little on the class. And I think that's a good thing for all of you to tell us as you go through the, go through the school. If, if there's an aspect you don't feel is coming out is not getting surfaced that you think should really be surfaced. We'll, we'll open it up for questions, but let me ask you, oh, is there a question? Oh, please go ahead, yeah. Um, another aspect um, that maybe isn't necessarily very present is um, the whole concept of geoengineering, um, which you know has, it pulls from so many different disciplines and it's controversial and exciting at the same time. And I found it very fascinating and I know one of the uh, most knowledgeable people in the world is here at Stanford and then one other on the East Coast, but in terms of coursework, I haven't seen anything um, regarding that and I think it's a really important area because even if it is very controversial, it's, it's on the forefront of potentially happening in the future if we have, you know, global catastrophe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's we, like that. I mean, we, uh, he does sometimes teach, but he's a Carnegie Institution um, scientist as well as a, a, in, a, in a consulting position in our school. And this is Ken Caldera. Yeah, Ken Caldera. <laughs> But he's not the only one. Actually, there are a number of us who uh, have thought deeply and written in that area, and it's a good point. We are, it, when, especially when you think about geoengineering um, as going beyond the, you know, uh, managing the climate by putting something up in the atmosphere to all the, the geoengineering that includes carbon capture and storage of different mm -hmm. sorts, which right. we do tremendous amounts Agriculture of. Agriculture is geoengineering. Yeah, well. it's, yeah. You, it can be anyway. Uh, carbon farming, you know, there's a lot of ideas out there that we're, we actually know a lot about. So good point. If we haven't already put it together in a package, we need to do so. Thank you. So let me, let me ask you one more question. We'll, we'll then we'll just open it up for questions. We talked about timing, because it's a very interesting time to be in the field of energy. Let's talk about geography, about space. We are located in a, what is often considered worldwide as the epicenter for innovation. This is Silicon Valley. 
And uh, how, first of all, how many international students out here? Yeah. Welcome to the United States. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to Stanford. Welcome yeah. to Stanford. Yeah. Um, given that we are here in the middle of Silicon Valley, where everyone is looking for, for you know, thought leadership and innovation, um, digital world for sure, but now we are seeing gradually many multinational energy companies putting up little shops around here. For the, from a student point of view, what would be your advice to leverage uh, this environment out here beyond Stanford? How would you think about that? I was going to even mention, related to the previous question, that one of the advantages of being at Stanford is that the surrounding people often get involved. So you're likely just naturally to hear from people who are in innovation and entrepreneurship around Silicon Valley. I'd be surprised if you didn't, in some of your classes or other activities, encounter those people. And I would just say, don't be hesitant to talk to them, um, because they love to come here and meet the students. And you know, don't be shy. That's why they're here. They want, they want to meet you. They want to tell you what's going on. They want you to get involved. Um, so, of course, our faculty are great, but there is this larger ecosystem around Stanford in just about every unit. Um, and so take advantage of that. Sometimes people will come and speak in the evenings. Just keep your eyes out. We're a very decentralized place, so you just need to constantly be looking around for these opportunities. Um, the other, of course, is to do internships here locally, uh, in, depending on whether you're a, and if you're in a one-year master's, not so necessarily, but if you're in a two-year master's or if you're in a PhD program, I would say I'd strongly encourage you to look at internship opportunities. And sometimes you can tie that in with your research. It can, it can all be a, a nice package um, connecting Stanford and the, at the outside. Yeah. First, can I, can I say that was fantastic when everyone raised their hands and we had all those uh, international students. I mean, what an amazing, what an, it just makes you reflect what an amazing place this is. We really do get people from all over the world to come here and be students. And that, of course, that you're going to learn a lot from each other. That's a big part of being here. I, two things I wanted to say. So one was just to pick up on Jennifer's point. She said, you know, about being, being here in Silicon Valley, you get to take advantage of the other people who are outside this campus but are in this ecosystem in Silicon Valley. That is just so true. It's part of the DNA of Stanford that we're very fluid with the surrounding environment. I was actually looking last night at the business school classes in energy. We have a model at the business school in our elective classes where we often will take an academic faculty member and we pair them to teach with a practitioner. Actually, every single one of the energy classes that we're offering is this model. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, an accounting professor paired with a venture capitalist. It's, a, it's, a, it's someone who works in the energy industry paired with an economist, so it's a, or whatever the, 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 the pairing is. And, um, and that's an amazing opportunity, because you get to see sort of the outside perspective, and then you get to see the academic perspective. And I think you get that in general at Stanford quite, quite a lot. I was going to say about, you know, but just to your point, Arun, about this being sort of the center of innovation. It, I was in India three weeks ago, and I was traveling around um, India uh, for the business school. And then we opened a program in Chennai, the Stanford Seed Program, which is where we, we our faculty go and work with entrepreneurial companies in the developing world. It's a really fabulous program. We opened the, opened in India uh, this fall, and. The thing that is, um, that is amazing about going there and representing Stanford in a, in a place like that is, of course, everyone looks at to Stanford and says, well, that's, you know, you're bringing, when you leave here, you're bringing a little bit of that innovative and entrepreneurial and sort of spirit of exploration with you wherever you go. And that's a great thing that you're going to have. You're going to get to be here. You're going to get to soak all that up. And then, you know, hopefully you'll go somewhere else probably. I mean, somebody will stay here, but you'll get to go and take it with you out into the world. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's just a great thing about being here. I think, uh, so while you're here, you really you know, soak it in. It's, uh, it's a pretty exciting, exciting thing to get to do for a few years. Okay. Yeah, you know, there, there, so in addition to the points that have already been made, the one thing I can think of that is maybe worth knowing about is that we, um, we Stanford is actually pretty good at purposefully building partnerships with the corporate world. I mean, we actually want to know that our, knowledge that we're creating through your research and our research is actually 
useful and usable and, and, and will be used by somebody. So we, we try to create different kinds of partnerships. And uh, we call them some of these affiliates programs, um, but GSEP was an example of that. And, and I know that Precourt has an affiliates program. Many of our uh, departments have affiliates programs. And they're intended to be a conversation, really, where we're sharing what we're learning. And we're learning from the various corporations that we're partnering with, generally, what their challenges are. And I think that, that um, that's a really neat thing. It doesn't, doesn't tell you what you have to do, but it gives you a sense of where their challenges are and where we can intersect. And um, so to the extent you can, you might want to look for those opportunities to learn through that kind of partnership as well as other, other things that the institutes can do. Well, this is a very rare opportunity for all of you to have three deans in front of you. I'm sure you have many questions. Let's just open it up if you have questions about you know, Stanford in general. But in, in general, yeah, go ahead. Uh, maybe you could just uh, not, you know, introduce yourself and who you are with school. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Sita Sile. Uh, I'm in mechanical engineering in the, in the design school. Um, and I had a question, you know, I'm an engineer, but I'm, I'm sure we'd all like to hear from each of you. From your perspective as being the dean of your school, how do you see your role as dean relating directly to us students? So, you know, I heard, like, you may teach a class or um, like, are you as a resource if we have ideas or, you know, the strategic planning, our stu perhaps students can get involved. So I guess, how, how do you see your role as dean as it directly relates to us students? I'll let you start and I'll mm -hmm. chime in. Oof, that's, that's a... That's a tough, so everything you said we did involve students in our strategic planning process. We like to hear from students. Our, our job as dean is actually to support the success of the faculty, staff, and students. That is our job, and that can mean different things at different times. There have, uh, might be a department where the students are unhappy with some structural issues or funding issues, and that will be the dean's job to go in and make sure everybody can be successful in that department, just figure it out. Sometimes we're just problem solvers to, to again, to make sure everybody's successful. Um, teaching classes is something that is not actually part of our job description, but we often like to do. I don't know if you, oh, yeah. you're teaching. Two this mm -hmm. quarter. Oh, two, <laughs> okay. So well, most, impressive. it's interesting, most deans just don't want to be as disconnected from the students as it could happen. That's actually sort of something that easily happens in the role. So I would say you'd find most deans finding ways to stay connected with students. You know, I made a personal choice, actually. I didn't think that I could continue running a research group and continue teaching as dean. Many people don't do either of those things. I chose to ramp down the research and, and keep the teaching going because, for me, that's more students. I'm, I think I'm going to have, like, 150 this fall. So <laughs> that's, I want to, you know, personally, I want to connect with students all the time and connect with as broad a, a group of students as I can. Yeah, that's a great question, though. It's a, you almost stumped us. We, no, no, no. I mean, we, we, we actually have a, an official mechanism. So I agree with everything you've said. You know, I mean, I, I just say come and talk anytime. But we do have an official mechanism. You guys probably do, too. We have a, a GSAC, the Graduate Student Advisory Council, that is the advisor to the dean and associate deans. And uh, we have uh, elected representatives from each of our departments and programs. And we meet at least quarterly, and they're very involved in, um, in, 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 they're given resources basically to reach out to their communities and make sure there's ongoing conversations about where the challenges and where the opportunities are and what students are, what their experience is and how we can help. So we do that very purposefully. And, you know, for example, later uh, tomorrow I'm going to be working with our GSAC members to plan a, a, a strategy session that they will then lead with our with their communities so that we get good feedback. So we do that all the time. But I also have to say at Stanford, if you haven't already found the Vice Provost for Graduate Education, you definitely will. It is an incredible um, office in the university. It has hugely, hugely helpful um, tools and advice for all graduate students in the university. Uh, lots of very ways to help support student activities. Um, lots of uh, tools that you can use as you think about your education and, and professional development. 
So they're our partners. All of the schools benefit mm -hmm. from the vice provost of graduate education. So be sure you take advantage of them too. Yeah, there are student groups and activities at all levels. So I would say in the School of Engineering, which is a rather large school, the we don't have one graduate student advisory council for the school. Each department has one. So in the, in the School of Engineering, as far as student involvement, it tends to affiliate more at the department level than the school level just because of the, the sheer size. Um, and I, I'm sure at the GSB, things have a very different flavor because it's a different setup. Yeah, we have, we, have, we have a student association, and that's a formal mechanism for students to, to, to put, get input into the to, to other folks at the, at the school. But I, I think actually to what, both what Jennifer and Pam just said, I mean, first of all, as a dean, basically you're in an enabling role. And at a place like Stanford, you're surrounded by so many people who are basically more talented than you are. So, like you're including you're, the students. You the, way, the way you succeed in a in a leadership role in a university is that other people do great things, and then it reflects well on you. <laughs> that, it's, and actually, I'm totally serious about that. I mean, it's sort of funny, but it, that actually is how university leadership sort of works. Basically, it's not that you do things and then other people, you know, speak for you, yourself. <laughs> He's right. He's right. And, and the second thing is, you know, everyone ends up here on the faculty and then in a dean role because they just like being around the people, you know, the, the students. I mean, that's sort of why, why else would you be here? And so that's, uh, I think that's the other part is that, it's, you know, I think most of the time if you're in a dean's role, if you can sort of find a way to just to go um, spend some time with the students, that's like the, that's the best part it's of your a day. Gift. <laughs> it's a gift <laughs> to the dean if you, you know, exactly. will be so willing to spend all, time I think with all us. of us try to do a lot of that. Questions? Uh, actually, since we have only like five or seven minutes left, why don't we actually have multiple questions and then we'll sort of group them? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Kabir. I am a master's student in mechanical engineering. And sort of following off of that earlier question about sort of mechanisms to, you know, get acclimated to Stanford in general, um, from your vantage point, what would you say the best mechanisms have been for students to sort of balance generating expertise in their own field? Um, yet still being able to, you know, get knowledge and meet people from other departments working on completely different things. So how do you go deep and then how do you create the T's or the mm -hmm. pies? Mm -hmm. okay, so that's one. Let's, yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm Simon. I'm from Material Science and Engineering. Um, I, from this conference, one of the main things that I've actually gotten out of it is that Stanford is clearly on the forefront of a lot of research uh, in the technical aspect and, of course, in the business and financial aspects. Um, however, one thing that I've also gotten is that policy change is going to be necessary in the future to help with climate change. And I was wondering what Stanford's doing and what they can do in the future to kind of create the kind of political atmosphere and climate that is more adaptive and able to address these issues more than they currently are now. Policy. What are we going to do in policy? Yes, over there. My name is Jan from Indiana, Shreve at DSD. So we talked about the partnership between Stanford and the corporate world doing the best for the environment. But then we all know the corporate world works for profit. So is there, I mean, is, is it, does it ever happen that there's a question between what's best for profit and what's best for the environment? And if yes, how do you deal with that? Yeah. Are the incentives aligned? Let's take these three, and then we'll come back to a few more. Uh, T and pi, um, policy, and incent al aligning incentives. Well, do a quick swipe of all of them, just quickly. I think that the the T and in, in the the pie <laughs> shape. Um, I I think that um, they're taking advantage of the energy um, community more broadly through the student groups, through the pre court institutes, various seminar series, um, all of the mechanisms. We've got a lot of ways you can do it. You can probably drown in them. There's so many ways, but you can you can give yourself that experience of broadening your own thinking. While you're while you're getting your depth, and, and there's they're there. It's pretty easy. I think on both on the policy and on the the trade-offs. Yeah. You know, it's how do we? This is a huge area. I believe Stanford's going to be roaring into this area in the coming years. It's a sustainability issue, mm -hmm. and it's, sustainability is not this this issue of meeting people's needs for the short and the long term is not going to be answered just by lots of new technologies. They're going to be incredibly important, but we got to get the whole social environmental system right, and the policy piece is huge. We have expertise in, in our school in engineering, obviously lots in business. It's all around the university. 
I think it's going to be brought to bear on these issues very, very quickly. The other thing I will say to your point is Stanford is walking the walk a lot on energy and climate. I hope you all get to see SESI. I hope you get I think to, they did that yesterday. Okay. Yeah. I, go, I hope you get to uh, see the broader range of things that we're trying to do as a university to grapple with this. And, and we're not stopping with the easiest things of a, you know, of a huge energy plant, but working on a lot of other issues. So engaging ourselves in that challenge is, is one of the best ways we can do that, and the university is doing that. So you guys are coming here at a great time. I think um, we're doing a long-range planning process in the university. I think this is going to emerge as a huge area of importance to us. John. Yes. I um, want to hear John's answer to how you balance profit and, uh, the, <laughs> and the environment, because you're the economist. <laughs> Let me take that one second, actually. <laughs> Just on the point about depth versus breadth, I, I actually think it depends. It, it, the answer might be different depending on where you're sitting in this room and where you're starting. If, if, if you're, for example, if you're coming into the business school as an MBA student, that's a degree that is of trying to give you, as I said, a, a broad education. It's trying to prepare you to be a you know, great manager and leader in a variety of ways. And so we're, we want to touch a lot of bases to give you those skills that make you adaptable in, in your career. And then you, if you have the opportunity, you can, you, you can and should try to go deep in a few areas that you're really passionate about that you, or that excite you. If you're here as a PhD student in economics, for example, take an area that I know, you, you have to get all the way to the frontier of the field and then beyond. And you, you just have to go really, really deep. And that's, you know, that's, that is your charge. That's what's going to get you ahead. And, and, so, and then to the extent that you have time to sort of get a lot of breath, that's great too. But your mandate while you're here is you, you, you've got to leave and people say, you're the best person in the world, young person in the world in that area. And it could be a little bit narrow, but that's, that's sort of what gets you ahead. So I think it does depend a little bit on kind of where you are. And assess, but I think assessing that, actually, that is one of the challenges in graduate school, is trying to figure out how much to kind of spread yourself out versus just sort of drill down. And, and that's, everyone has to sort of figure that out for themselves individually and with your advisors and mentors and, and so forth. The other questions. Wow, those are those are those are great questions. And I, actually, let me just preface it by saying, I mean, you know, you're you're like, it's like we're it's a pretty unusual point in the world. And so that I I, I was here. I had the we had the twenty fifth business school reunion last weekend, and one of the one of the people came and asked a question that was it was one of our MBA alums who's twenty five years out, and and they basically asked a question which was like, is it is it sort of end times for capitalism? And I thought, you know. <laughs> I said, wow, I, I didn't expect to be the, end up as the dean of the Stanford Business School and have people ask me whether <laughs> capitalism was, one of my alums asked me whether <laughs> capitalism was, was, was over. But you know, we're at like a time in the world where that question's not a surprise, it's sort of not a surprising question. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, it, not a surprising, I mean, it's a little surprising coming from the MBA, but it's not a, not, a, not a totally surprising question. And I think, you know, that's, um, you're lucky to be here at that kind of time because, like, this is this is you know, the, you know to your, similarly to your question about how do you sort of you know bring in social change into thinking about energy and the environment. I mean, the thing about being on this campus is this is a great place to talk about those issues about how you know how is our society going to adapt in different ways to changes in the world, to, and not just to technological changes in the world, but to political and social changes in the world. And everybody gets to take part in that discussion. You know, that doesn't have to just happen in the classroom. That's a discussion. That's, that's what we're all talking about here all the time. I mean, that's sort of like everyone's talking about that. And, you, and you're going to get to do that here with all these other people from different backgrounds and all over the world. And uh, you Well, should. this afternoon, actually, we're going to have George Schultz. And um, you guys, if he doesn't raise it himself, which I think he will, ask him about the carbon price, about his approach to revenue neutral carbon tax yeah. and what it implies. That's really aligning incentives. Um, and making sure that business and environment are, are aligned in some way. So I'm sure we'll talk about that. You know, I have to say, too, that to, to both of those points, that, um, right, well, as we speak, we're running a, an executive ed program, and I know the GSB has run similar executive programs, where the, it's all about how you do that balancing. It's all about how you be um, a business that cares about the long-term well-being of both the business and people and the environment all together, a sustainability perspective. So 
it's, it's happening. Uh, but I think we are in the early stages. <laughs> I know that Jennifer has to leave. And so let, let's, let's give them a big round of applause. Yeah, thank you. For, I think this could have gone on for another hour. And uh, there's so much of interest in this topic. Thank you so much for, for being here.